Uh, my name is Patrick Russell. I'm an ecologist with Wetland Surveys Ireland. Uh, last year, 2019, I was involved in the Leitrim Wetland Survey. Um, this was undertaken on behalf of Leitrim County Council and the Heritage Council. Uh, together with my colleagues, Peter Foss, Mary Catherine Gallagher and Brendan Kerwin, we produced the first wetland map of uh, County Leitrim. Uh, this, uh, this map displays all different wetland types throughout the county where we would have looked at the resource and tried to estimate the extent and the distribution of wetlands throughout the county. Um, I suppose to start off talking about wetland heritage, I suppose the place to start really is to define a wetland and what exactly is a wetland. It's basically an ecosystem that has evolved or formed uh, under wet conditions and where all the plants and animals that occur there are, are a result of those wet conditions that are especially adapted to the wet conditions that prevail. Uh, to define a wetland, it's, um, it's basically uh, as by the Ramsar Convention, which is an agreement in 1971 which Ireland is a signatory their definition is probably the most widely used and they define it as an area of, uh, of uh, where the water table is at or near the surface or there's water shallow water covering an area for part of the year or for the entire year so they can be temporary or permanently wet they can be artificial or man or natural and um, they can include uh, areas of bogs fens marshes lakes rivers uh, even coastal areas such as mangroves or, or um, coral reefs even, anything up to six meters depth of marine water be included in, in wetlands. Uh, so the water can be flowing, it can be stagnant, it can be fresh, it can, can be brackish or it can be salt water. So that, that's it's all encompassing really, it, it is a very broad uh, category of, of uh, ecosystem or uh, habitat types. So uh, I suppose what we're on at the moment, or where we are at the moment, is out in the peatland. And to be a bit more specific, there's two different types of peatland, a bog or a fen. And what we're on now is known as a raised bog. It's a special type of peatland ecosystem. It's uh, typically raised bogs. They occur, they're very typical and characteristic of the Irish Midlands. They extend as far north, maybe as the south of County Leitrim. So just along the southern part of County Leitrim, you get these raised bogs. Now raised bogs, they, I suppose peatland, first of all, well, what defines a peatland? You've got... Uh, an area of, of uh, wet ground where there's a peat formation and peat is organic material like remains of plants that has, hasn't fully decomposed and that just builds up over time to form peat. So that, that's the peatland and then between, within that category you've got bogs and fens. Fens are areas where you've still got mineral influence from groundwater or surface water. It's not totally reliant on rainwater, which is the case with bogs. So bogs are especially nutrient poor and mineral poor and they're deficient in those so you get extremely specialized plants that don't grow anywhere else and they can survive in these unique kind of conditions. So the, the nutrients and all come from the atmosphere. It's, it's it totally dependent on rainwater for their survival. I suppose just looking at this place where we are at the moment, if you were to come here after the last ice age or at the end of the last glaciation around 10,000 years ago, it would have been a, a, a wide open basin or a, a shallow lake would have occurred throughout this area. Uh, over time that would have infilled gradually with maybe reeds and reed swamp type uh, vegetation which you'd see along the edge of lakes thing, uh, today. Uh, that would have gradually progressed and because of the poor oxygen conditions in the water, the reeds and everything else, they would never fully decomposed and built up over time. And this would have formed a peat layer. Now, eventually the entire lake basin would have been filled in, if you could imagine that. And it would have still been supplied by groundwater or the water influenced by the mineral soil underneath. So you would have had vegetation very different to today. It would have been tall reeds and uh, rushes and that kind of uh, vegetation type. But then gradually the, the peat layers built up above that surface of the lake 
and because of the uh, the amount of rainfall we have in, in central Ireland you would have got a growth of um, vegetation that loves those acid conditions provided by rainfall and nutrient poor mineral deficient. So then you would have got the vegetation like what I'm standing in at the moment with sphagnum mosses being particularly characteristic and the heathers and all that, they, that would have moved in and again you got the decomposition doesn't occur so layer and layer of vegetation builds up as peat, doesn't decompose and then over thousands of years you got the bog just continuing to build up, accumulate and accumulate and accumulate until now we've probably got maybe 10 metres of peat underneath us right here that's more than 30-40 feet of, of peat uh, and that's grown above the, the surface of the former lake so that's um, kind of the evolution of the site here if you were to go down 6 metres you'd be at that original surface of the lake and you get a different type of peat from there down deeper that it is not necessarily a massive variety of wildlife but yeah. the wildlife that do occur here are very specialized and unique to bogs they couldn't survive anywhere else so for that reason bogs would be very important for for conserving biodiversity generally that if you were to lose these areas you'd lose that whole suite of species that can't survive elsewhere um, but as I said the, the characteristics of, of the bog would include your sphagnum mosses so We've got these here, they've got all different types of colours of sphagnum mosses. We've got these, these red ones, the yellow ones, all of those are different individual species. And then they occur, they're known as a bog builder. They're certainly the most important species that occur in a raised bog. And it's, it's the accumulation of these that really gives, gives rise to the peat and the, the peat that traditionally would have been burnt as turf in, in our houses. So it's almost exclusively made up of this and then the heathers and stuff are intermixed with it. And if you were to, in scientific research, they often do cores of bogs where you'd put down a pipe and you'd pull up the peat throughout the different sections. And if you even looked at a, a bit of peat that might be there four meters down that might have been sitting there for 4,000 years. You can look at that under a hand lens or even a microscope and you can still identify the exact same species occurring in the profile further down. Now the thing about the, these these bog mosses is that they're they're except they're like a sponge. They they retain a, a vast quantity of water. So like if you were to squeeze this, you just get a massive amount of water out of it. So it's about uh, I think it's 20 times their own weight in water is what these can hold. So if you can think of that across this entire peatland, the amount of water that this is actually retaining in the ground is is huge. So if you were to remove this and harvest it or whatever, then you'd lose that ability to retain water. That water has to go somewhere. Somewhere, it ends up in the rivers and potentially gives rise to flooding. So this is one of the values I suppose of, of retaining these areas of bog that they, they act as a sponge and retain water within the landscape that it isn't uh, giving rise to potential flooding and other issues downstream. Um, just to give you an, another indication of the different types of sphagnum moss, you got these red ones, which are just out of interest, it's sphagnum capillifolium. You get these other ones that occur in much wetter areas, sphagnum cuspidatum. It's just the different types of types of mosses. And it's just transition that's, that's very uh, typical of raised bogs where you get um, these wetter type species occurring in, in depressions or in hollows. And then these redder ones would form little hummocks or raised areas on the bog. So on an intact bog, the, the bog that's never been cut, you get this fantastic formation of pools, hummocks and hollows. And each of these species have their own little place that they like to grow on the bog. And that gives rise to the, the accumulation of peat. The other plants then, not only the mosses, but you got these um, these uh, grey, light grey coloured things. This is a, a lichen, a lichen. Um, again, there's a, a wide variety of, of different types. Got one here, which is known as antler horn lichen. Uh, this one here, they're, they're both related, but not quite the same. Um, I mean, lichens, they, they can, certain species can indicate good water, good air quality. Uh, these are one of the first things to disappear once this bog has been burnt. So if we're ever doing surveys of sites and if we're looking at, at whether it's been burnt or not recently, these are one of the species that takes a long, long time for them to come back onto a bog once it's been burnt. So they're, they're, they're very sensitive. So you've got the, the mosses, as I mentioned, the sphagnums, the lichens, and then the other layer you got is the shrub layer. They're very typical of bogs. Again, you got heathers, these dwarf shrubs. We've got probably three different species of heathers growing here in the bog. Cladonia is the, is the Latin name given to that one. Um, you've got your bog rosemary occurring here, and your other 
shrubs then would include your heather. So there's two different heathers here. There's this one here. There's another one there, which is the common heather. And then you've got your plants. So all this wispy, um, grassy stuff is bog cotton. So unfortunately, all the heads are gone right now. And there's a few other species like that. This one here is uh, called um, white beak sedge. It's actually a food plant of Greenland white-fronted geese. So that's uh, that one there. Uh, the other one here is um, bog asphodel, which you got these lovely orange, orange flower heads. Um, again, if you go out here early July, you'd have beautiful yellow flower. They're just gone over now, they're, they're going to seed. Um, and the bog asphodel, I suppose it, it's an interesting plant in that wherever that was growing, it, it, was, it was thought that it would cause, cause brittle bones in, in animals or in livestock traditionally. And I think rather than there being anything in the plant itself that uh, caused the brittle bones, it was just that where that grew, there was absolutely no nutrients or minerals in the soil or in the, in the vegetation. So the animals would never, would never uh, do well there anyway. So that, that's why they would have been associated with that, I suppose, in such a recognizable species. So I, I suppose these raised bogs, as I said, they're a very, very unique habitat. They are very characteristic of the Midlands of Ireland. They would have once occurred throughout Northwest Europe. Like people often associate bogs only with Ireland, but that, that's just today. In the rest of Europe, they've actually been cut away in that. But for example, the Netherlands would have had vast areas of beetland in the past, but today it's all been cut away and converted to farmland or, or uh, and other uses. So Ireland's unique in that we still have a, a proportion of our peatlands remaining. Now, it's not a very high proportion. It's still only about 1% are in a near natural state. So 99% of Irish peatlands have actually, or raised bogs have actually been lost, mostly due to commercial peat extraction, turf cutting, even forestry. You can see forestry on the edge of this bog here, uh, and other land uses. So what is remaining, I think it's very important that we do conserve it and then look at how we'd do that. And even there's a drive now towards restoring bogs, and that, that's where you want to raise the water table back to where it once was. So you can see that there's a drain running along the side here. And uh, to re-wet a bog, you're talking about blocking those drains, actively blocking them and bringing the water table back up to the surface to allow the vegetation like we have here to re-establish and to re-wet. So I think that's probably the way Ireland is going to be going in the future. And one of the big reasons for that as well, and one of the big benefits of going that way is carbon capture. These are a huge resource of carbon in the ground, locked away. And if you get the bog to, to be in good condition, it's actively accumulating carbon. So taking it out of the atmosphere and building it up and locking it away in the ground. And you could just imagine if we're standing on 10 meters of peat over this 100 hectare site, you're talking an awful lot of carbon when there's 90% of that peat is actually carbon stored away. So it's, it's huge quantities and that's probably, it's probably, peatlands are going to play a big, big role in the combat for climate change into the future. Um, with regards to protection, the 1% of sites that do remain in the country, they're given formal protection as, as European sites or special areas of conservation. Um, it's important that, again, these land uses that are, aren't compatible with this conservation such as peat cutting or, or forestry or drainage, that they'd be um, that you'd halt those activities on these sites and give the bog a chance to, to uh, um, continue to accumulate carbon, uh, carbon to restore. Uh, as I mentioned, the raised bog which we're on at the moment is, is just one type of peatland, which itself is one type of wetland. And as I was bringing it back to Leitrim, you've got your your raised bogs which you're on at the moment in, in the very south of the county, down here, kind of um, south of Moville is where you've got your centre of, of raised bog distribution. Further north then we move into the Drumlin Belt and you've got a lot of lakes and marshes and fens and that occupying these basins within the Drumlin. So that would be very characteristic of the central part of the county. And then further north again you've got your uplands and the blanket bogs which are similar to this but they, 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 it's so wet in those areas the bog can actually grow up over hills and grow on slopes. So that's where you've got your blanket bog, it blankets the landscape. Uh, very typical of the west of Ireland but also occurs as I say in these uplands in in the northern part of Leitrim, up around Glencarver or Glenade. And the other thing about up there is you got um 
you got springs and a lot of calcareous type wetlands being fed by the water that comes down through the limestone of the uplands in, in that part of the county. So you, you have a great wet, wealth of wetlands. And, and further north again, even along the coast, you've got your dune slacks. It's only about four or five kilometres of coastline that, that Leitrim has, but you do have that variation. You've got your, your special wetlands that occur within those sand dunes, and you've got little coastal areas of coastal and marine wetland habitats. So you do have the full range of different uh, wetland types occurring in, in Leitrim, the great wealth and variety of them. Um, the wetland map of Ireland, which we were involved with last year, I mentioned earlier, that uh, that was a mapping exercise. So we would have tried to quantify the amount of wetland in the county. And that we would have come out maybe about 23% of the county would be considered wetland habitat of some type or another. Uh, that would equate to in excess of maybe 300 sites. Um, and of those, we have very, very little information on those sites. Maybe 25% of them might have been subject to some kind of field survey in the past. But the rest we just have it from aerial photography or from uh, soil maps and from interpretation of other mapping resources which is what we would have interpreted last year during our, our mapping exercise of the county. So it, I suppose moving forward that's phase one is kind of complete where we have our, our map of the wetlands but we, we don't know enough about them to be able to rank them of importance and to be able to identify those that are of highest importance to maybe conserve or to uh, guide future land use and future decision making in the county. So I think phase two is, is yet to really kick off where I think it's important that uh, surveys will be done on the ground by ecologists where they'd go out and identify the types of wetlands that are occurring on these sites and rank them in importance, determine whether they're maybe international importance or maybe just local importance. And then depending on that importance, that should guide future land use practices and management. I mean, it's, it's all about kind of wise use and sustainable use of wetlands into the future. So, I mean, there's certain sites like here which would be ranked as international importance where it should be given the strictest level of protection but other sites might well be suitable for some form of agricultural use or even visitor use and that kind of thing that could be promoted as such. I think for the future conservation and protection of wetlands, I think it's very important that landowners are engaged with and that the farming community is brought along and like we as a society, we need to really value these habitats and what they do for for us as, as society and you know the flood prevention value of them, the, the water purification value, they take out pollutants and, and sediment out of, out of water and, and, and lock it away and the other value being carbon and climate change as well as biodiversity. So, so there are all these values that these wetlands in their current state are, provi are providing to us and I think we really as a society need to value that and if that means rewarding farmers or other land users uh, for the management or conservation of these sites well so be it and, and we should be rewarding farmers for the for the good good practice and good management of these sites and I mean there's some interesting projects out there at the moment that are trialing results-based approaches to this where you know there's no reason farmers sh shouldn't get some of the cap payments for good management of wetlands and sustainable management of wetlands where they're getting paid for the provision of all these goods and services that these wetlands are providing. So I, I think that's a very good and important way of moving forward that the, the quality of the habitat is reflected in the payments to the farmers. And, and this has the added thing that they, it's, there's an incentive there then for the farmer to improve the quality of them through whatever types of management and that they get paid and rewarded for that. I, I think that'd be very important because up to now, the value has been on green land or on, on intent on chain and it, people don't value them and they end up draining wetlands and infilling them or whatever it is and then we lose those ser important services that they're providing so I think that there's a big change in, in opinion needed on that and that we really do need to value them and reward those that do manage them appropriately.